Welcome to the Rounds to Residency podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Each episode, get clinical rotation advice and tips to prepare for your externships and residency in healthcare. We interview preceptors and physician educators who will prepare you for your rotation and improve your clinical experience. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. Today, we are joined by Dr. Kelly Kasperson, surgeon entrepreneur, speaker, and educator. She covers topics of female pelvic health, sexuality, and urologic wellness. Kelly, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, I'd like to start off with a little icebreaker question, and that is, how are you changing medicine or medical education for the better? Or if you prefer, what is the biggest challenge facing residents in your specialty? I'm changing medicine and health in general by educating I'm educating people about sex ed much differently. I think, first of all, most med schools don't even teach sex ed. And when you think about what's the point of a doctor to help people live their best lives, right? Sleep well, eat well, exercise well, love well. Sex ed is a huge part of it. If anything, I think most medical students got about an hour of it. And that's in the quote unquote progressive medical schools. And sex ed in our country in general is taught very fear-based. It was only a couple of years ago when I actually learned about sex positive sex education, meaning showing sex in a positive light instead of like i think it's the movie uh, mean girls where it's like you're gonna catch a disease you're gonna get pregnant and then you'll die <laughs> view it's like the gym teacher teaching sex ed of like that's what average sex ed is in our country and it's like t- realizing where we are and realizing we could teach it in such a better way because most people are sexual and they kind of get trapped in the doldrums mostly because they don't get good education in the first place. So that's how I'm trying to change medicine, sex education, and couples having good sex lives in general. I like it. Yeah, I don't think we even covered sex ed in my school at all. So not even that one hour. Probably the last time was, what, in high school when they cover it for that one day for a couple hours? And it's not something that's talked about a lot. And I definitely hear more about sex positivity, especially the past year or so, a lot more than ever before. So I feel like this is a trend that's going to continue and get more popular. And it's good to see that you're kind of pushing forward and making sure that your patients are quite aware of this too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I have the kind of, you know, sexual minorities to thank for this. It's like the marginalized communities who are speaking out and making us all realize like, well, the majority didn't actually start from a really good standing in the first place, right? Who's taking care of the heterosexual women, for instance? And so really giving my thanks to the people who came, you know, in the LGBTQ community to say, hey, the heteronormative people, I wouldn't say are, you know, have an overabundance of sexual education to start with. That's very true. Yeah, it's, (laughs) I know there's a whole convoluted history behind it, but probably not the best form for it since we might get too political for some students and physicians, but We'll definitely be able to reference your material for those that are more interested in it. And I am kind of curious as to just sort of if students are interested in knowing more about this from a professional aspect, how can they go about learning more? How can they go about communicating with their patients a little bit more? And what topics are really common? A huge topic is desire, sexual desire. That's a, that one of the most common reasons a woman would seek out care in their, for her physician's office is low desire. And a great resource for students is ISHWISH, which is the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, actually started by a urologist over 20 years ago. It's multidisciplinary. It's physical therapists, sex therapists, family practice, OB-GYN. I, I went there. I'm a urologist. And I actually ran into an uh, OB guy who I went to medical school with. We actually did our surgery rotation together. And I'm like, what are you doing here? Because I assumed that the OB guys would already be experts and not need to go to conferences, right? And she's like, we didn't get taught about this either. We, you know, the OB guys don't know. And we kind of assume they're the experts, but it's a four-year residency. They've got to take care of birth control, babies, hysterectomies. Like they're already very, very busy. They also aren't covering kind of female sexual health 101. Wow. So do you see that there's a big difference in the fields of ob versus urology, or is it just nobody really has much education in this so far? I'd say nobody has any education so far. <laughs> <laughs> That's like my gross generalization. I see, now that I'm a sexual expert, I do vulvar exams for a living, is how many women come to me being told they've had a normal exam 
by ob and then I do an exam and I'm like, no, there's nothing normal about this whatsoever, right? And so it's like to get your basic training on physical exam, and I think, you know, I'm not that old, but we rely on the physical exam less and less. We have amazing CAT scans, we've got amazing tests, and it's like really if medical students can learn their physical exam findings, it'll help you over and over and over again, and especially when it comes to genitals, right? We just really get a under training in that part of the body. Yeah, I'd agree. Besides the maybe a couple of weeks in embryology, and then of course when you're doing your actual ob studying for a shelf exam or for the board exam sections there, much less is described about maybe the emotional or attachment type of topics that are going to be very important for like a holistic treatment and understanding of what your patient's going through. Totally. I mean, a huge one, I, you know, I think about sex is everybody's expected to be an expert and nobody got any training, right? is people don't know how to communicate to their partners about sex. And it's like, well, doctors don't really know how to do that either, right? So you can do a huge service to your patient just by listening, helping them figure out how to communicate with their partner about it, because communication goes a huge way. There's so much shame and kind of assuming and shoulding going on with this topic. Yeah, I think society in general has a lot to learn about this. Just because it's a normal biologic process doesn't mean that we really understand it or discuss it in a healthy manner. 100%. All right. So moving over to maybe later students or early residents, they're going into or already in maybe if you're a student thinking about going into urology. And I suppose that's one of the early matches too? That's an early match. Okay. What would be some things that maybe students could look forward to? And maybe they don't even have the ability to do a clinical rotation or gain actual experience in this beforehand, there seems to be a a large gap there where if you're looking to go into that specialty, you might not really know what to expect. Yeah. If you're not exposed to it, you don't even, I mean, I can only speak from personal experience, but I'm like, thank goodness I had to pick two surgical subspecialties early on in third year and it was ortho and it was urology. I think mostly by luck or maybe I wasn't interested in neurosurgery. I don't know how it worked, but I was like, I got to see urology super early on in third year, which really helped, especially since it's an early match. So I think exposure to it, if you don't see it, and the other thing is seeing people like you that are in it, which I didn't have. I went to the University of Minnesota Medical School. There was one female urologist in the entire state at that time, and I still to this day have never met her. So it's like there wasn't a lot of people who looked like me going into urology, but luckily I had very supportive advisors and you know, great urologists who were there who supported me in going to do that. Because now I'm like, it's like Harry Potter and the matching hat is like, urology pick me, I pick urology, we're meant to be, it's a happy match. <laughs> I think a lot of students are never going to have the opportunity to have a urology rotation to gain that experience, to really know if it's going to be a good fit for them or if it's just maybe a passing interest. So I suppose... If a student wanted to explore that more and wasn't able to necessarily get a clinical rotation, gain a clerkship in that specialty, are there other ways that they can go about learning more and preparing for it? Yeah, I think there's some good websites. I think urologymatch.com might be really geared towards the medical student in figuring out. Check me on that website before you post it in your show notes. But there is a pretty big website now for medical students looking to match. And there's a lot of like, what is urology and all that stuff on there. There's more and more urologists on social media that you can follow and kind of see it's a social media view of what people's lives are like. But urology is, I mean, why I was attracted to it is people tend to be pretty good natured. You know, it's, it's, you have to deal with genitals every day. So you kind of have to have a, you know, roll it off your back personality and be okay with that sort of stuff. Procedure based, me being in clinic all day long, day in, day out was going to be mind numbing for me. I like solving problems quickly with my hands. The idea of just like adjusting somebody's lisinopril dose and like trying to make them not smoke is like torture to me. I'm like, don't make me do that for my whole life. I can't. But I'm like, you had a kidney stone and I took it out. You had a bladder tumor. I took it out. So satisfying. It's just that instant gratification that urology gives you. So figure out what your personality is really in trying to figure out what your match is and figure out are the people in that specialty, do they share your personality traits, right? Like urologists tend to like to joke around. We don't like to take ourselves too seriously. We're hard workers. We're really smart. We love technology. Urology has a lot of like lasers and new toys. You know, we like kind of pushing the envelope of medical innovation. 
So urology is very cool. And it's also so specialized, but it's so broad. Like you can just deal with prostates. You can just deal with kidneys. You can just deal with sex. You can just deal with penises. Like you, you can really niche down within it and find your passion. Interesting. Okay. Did you know you can find and schedule your own clinical rotations? Students can reach out to preceptors nationwide and schedule their own rotations. You can even refer a friend, earning you credit towards clinical externships of your choosing. Go to findarotation.com for more information. That's Find a Rotation, your medical and healthcare clinical rotations platform. I know I posted this on one of the Facebook groups docs on social media recently it's that chart that a lot of students are aware of anyway that kind of has all the different specialties and like arrows pointing here and there and the one going towards urology is you like penis jokes in general <laughs> yeah yeah we think that that like memes about that are perfectly fine it seems like a lot of the female reproductive health is generally cared for more by ob gyn and the male reproductive health is more in urology, but it sounds like, at least from your practice, that that's not necessarily true. Yeah, it's an interesting crossover as far as like distal or closer to the outer body, right? Like I don't do pap smears, I don't deal with the uterus, I don't deal with the ovaries. So like all of the internal female structures, that's not my wheelhouse at all. But it's like my comfort in urology with the bladder, the urethra, the labia is the scrotum, the penis is the clitoris. It's all, we all have homologous structures. And urology also is very comfortable talking about erections and penises and sex and like that's always very natural to us and so it finally clicked in my brain like who's taking care of the 50 percent of people that the guys with viagra are sleeping with who's taking care of them and i wrongly assumed ob was and a lot of them told me they're the ones who told me no we're not we're so stinking busy we can't take care of that too right and so urology really lends itself because we already have a comfort zone with 50 percent of the population not all urologists will deal with female sexual health. It lends itself very kindly to just being like, of course I'm going to take care of those people. I give their partners Viagra every day. Got it. So it sounds like personality-wise, personality traits, you really need to be happy-go-lucky, be easy to talk to, be able to joke around with your specialty and about the topics of your specialty, really make the patient feel comfortable with topics they're probably not comfortable in talking about usually. Do you think there are any other traits or characteristics that really would make someone a good fit for urology? I think the instant gratification, right? Knowing you fixed a problem today because you showed up, they couldn't pee and now they can, you know, like that's very satisfying sort of stuff. So we, we like working with our hands. We like, so, you know, solving problems. W women in urology now are about 9%, which is supposed to be amazing, right? But that's still super minority. That it is. And it seems like you mentioned a little bit of this already, but there are so many different routes to go with urology. There's a lot of toys, a lot of surgeries, a lot of just different things you can do with the specialty. And are there different types of maybe research or fellowships that are in that field that you wouldn't be able to accomplish in other places? Yeah, I mean, urology is kind of like other surgeries in like you can do a fellowship in on the oncology component of it, right? You can do a fellowship in like endoscopic kidney stones. You can do a fellowship in male infertility. There's one fellowship in the entire United States of America for female sexual dysfunction. That's by Erwin Goldstein in San Diego. Again, he's the one who started Ishwish, so he's a urologist. Pediatrics, of course, right? Any surgical subspecialty, can, you can do a fellowship in pediatrics. So the sky's the limit, but I think my chair of my program did such a kindness to me when I was contemplating fellowships. And he's like, are you really going to stay in academics? Is that what you want to do? I was at the point of like, I'm sick of climbing this ladder. You know, am I going to climb this ladder for the rest of my career? And he's like, if you're not going to go into academics, you don't need a fellowship. Right. So things to think about when we spent, we spent our entire career going to school and being in academics. And at the end of the day, 90% of urologists are private practice. All right. I know there's a lot of topics that you generally cover with your podcast, with your other materials. I kind of just want to go down the line and give me the first thing that comes to your head about it, if that's all right. Yeah. So you mentioned limiting beliefs, and I believe this was in conjunction with the sex ed part. Is that correct? Oh, limiting beliefs control our lives and everything, right? True. 
you know, I'm not smart enough to get into that fellowship. I'm not smart enough to be a urologist. All the limiting beliefs we have as med students, right? Women shouldn't be surgeons. You know, all these things that we think are facts. Oh, women shouldn't be surgeons if they want to have a family, right? Like all these things are truly limiting beliefs and we live our lives as if they're facts. I use that a lot in sex, right? Of like, if you truly believe that sex is hard or it's confusing or it's difficult, if you believe that, you're going to look for evidence for that. And once you start seeing your thoughts as not as facts, but actually just thoughts you're kind of hanging on to, you get to challenge them. And you get, get to be like, is that thought actually serving me? Or is that thought actually not going to be helping me in pursuing my dream? And what is the arrival fallacy? Oh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be happy when right? Which medical students and residents, we totally are in the arrival fallacy of like, when I get into med school, I'm going to be happy. When I match into my top residency, I'm going to be happy. When I'm finally in attending, I'm going to be happy. When I get married, I'm going to be happy. When I've paid off my debt, I'm going to be happy. Like it's always this future thing. And we miss that the only point you can actually be happy is in the present moment. I come into that super honestly. I spent my entire life getting to the next step. And only now that I, I've been out of residency now for about nine years, and I'm like, this is exactly where I am. So I've stopped arriving. But yeah, if you think about it, if you're like, the only place you can actually be happy is right now, then you're like, what are you waiting for tomorrow for? I feel like I'm always doing that. Well, when the next product comes out, when the next podcast episode, when the, <laughs> the next group of followers joins up. Totally. And if you can switch, you know, you and everybody in the universe, right? If you can switch the mentality to be like, the journey is actually the whole point, right? And it's like, what if people told us that the whole time we were in this medical school journey of like, enjoy med like medical school, man, medical school is nerd camp, like super expensive nerd camp. It's like, enjoy the nerd camp, man. You will never be in nerd camp again. It is an awesome place to be. I love that nerd camp. You also give tips on picking a good mate. Now that sounds really difficult to do. There's a lot of variation there, right? So how do you give advice on picking a good mate? Well, I'm a woman. I have socialized as a woman, so I understand my viewpoints are from a female standpoint, but it's like women are very, very good at trying to change people. Here's what the first advice is. Don't try to change your mate. If you can love that person for truly who they are, you're going to be so much happier. Surprise alert, you can't actually change other people, but we work so hard on perfecting ourselves and medical students, doctors, we tend to really be perfectionist people and think we're not good enough, right? So we take that into our spouses, into our kids, into our family very naturally. And it's like, you can't change anybody else. They're allowed to be whoever they want to be. If your only job is to love them for that person, so much more enjoyable. So yeah, that's what would be the first thing. It's like, I'm telling you how to choose your other spouse by telling you how to fix yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, luckily I have a spouse who's non-medical and very early on in our relationship, he's like, you can't change me. And like, that was massive resistance for me. But luckily I learned it super early. It's like, my only job is to love him. That's it. All I have to do. And he's going to thrive the best because that's all I have to do for him. Got it. It's pretty awesome. And then, you know, we haven't actually mentioned the name of your show yet. We should probably do that. Oh, yes. So my podcast is called You Are Not Broken. It came to me. So I started this whole sex med thing because I had a patient crying in my clinic, bawling her eyes out because she had no desire for sex, hadn't been intimate with her husband in years, and she was devastated by it. And I had no idea how to help her. I'd been in private practice for years, did a urology residency, board certified, had no idea how to help her. So that's when I really dove deep into sexual medicine, sexual health, and women after women then would come in and feel so broken. And I'd end the conversation by like, hey, you're not broken. And they'd be just so happy to realize like they were just having a normal female common experience in our society. I'm like, you're not broken. It's not you, right? It's just our lack of education. And so then I'm like, that's what the podcast is going to be called. You are not broken. Because I think just the average person to realize, don't take it so personally. It's not you. It's not your personality flaw. Like we didn't get any education. We don't know how things work and then they don't work and we think it's our fault. So you're not broken. I'm also on Instagram at Kelly Casperson MD. I go live there a decent amount. Right. Yeah. I think normalizing and being able to have open communication is the best way to normalize things. So we don't think that there's something wrong with us. It's really most likely quite common, as you said. <laughs> totally. Do you have any last words of wisdom or clinical pearls? 
Yeah. So I think my, for, if I'm thinking about advice for like younger people and in, in the physician journey is like, if you have a voice in your head or you've got something you're passionate about and you're waiting for somebody to give you permission, we spend our whole life waiting for permission, right? Permission to get into med school, permission to match into residency, permission to have a job. If there's truly something you're passionate about, like starting a podcast or, you know, doing what you're doing, it's like nobody's going to come around and give you permission for that. Giving yourself permission is what you need. And the sooner you figure that out, the more fun you're going to have with life. <laughs> I love it. Well, Dr. Kelly Casperson, thank you so much for coming on the show. Absolutely. Happy to be here. The Rounds to Residency podcast is powered by Med School Coach. To access Med School Coach services, like USMLE tutoring or residency admissions advising, visit our website at medschoolcoach.com. Good luck as you prepare for your board exams, and we hope you tune in again next time.